as we begin our Good Friday service, just to share in case all of you have not heard yet. Uh, obviously, you know that your pastor has been going through difficult family times. Uh, his father did pass away early this morning. So uh, obviously keep Pastor Bill and his family in your prayers and your concerns. Uh, tonight, we gather to remember. So we do that as we begin just by sharing our greeting. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Pray with me. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, was lifted high upon the cross so that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we, who glory in his death for our salvation, may also glory in his call to take up our cross and follow him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And hear now these words from the psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver them, since he delights in them. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even in my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Now if you could share responsibly with me in the litany on those seven last words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Woman, Behold your son, behold your mother. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. The litany that we just used to use words from the seven last words from Jesus on the cross. So tonight I'm going to share with you one of those words. And the word 
is from Luke 23, 43, where Jesus said, Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now those words were spoken to one of the other men who were hanging on a cross next to Jesus. So I'm going to back up to verse 39 and read the full account. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are being punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Now as we think about this interchange between the three crucified men, I want us to think about Jesus' reply to the one man hanging next to him. The words that we just read in the New International Version, Jesus' response is recorded this way. I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. So as we reflect on the power and the hope of these words of Jesus, I want us to particularly think about three different words in Jesus' statement. And those words being truth, today, and paradise. Now there's many trains of thoughts about Jesus' words as well as who these two men were that were crucified with Jesus. You know, I thought to myself, how is it that criminals, or if you read some of the other versions, it calls them thieves or even robbers. But how was it that these criminals knew about Jesus' godliness and his claims to be the Messiah? Well, most probably the two that were crucified with Jesus were Jewish also for the Romans did not crucify their own people. And Jesus' notoriety must have been well known among all the Jews with many different reactions to Jesus. Some biblical scholars think that these two men that were crucified with, with Jesus were zealots, those who resisted Roman rule. And being caught in acts of violence against Rome, they were crucified with Jesus who was seen as a messianic pretender, someone also who could stir up trouble against Rome. But regardless, these two were in a desperate situation, so they cried out to Jesus, but in strikingly different ways. The first, according to scripture, hurled insults against Jesus. Now, we don't know all the insults that might have been spoken, but the New Living Translation states that he said, So, you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it. Prove it by saying, saving yourself and us too. Well, not only was this first crucified man trying to get out of his terrible situation, but he challenged Jesus to act like what he and many other people thought the Messiah was supposed to do, that the Messiah would come and save the Jews from Roman rule. Now the other condemned criminal rebuked the first, and he confessed his faith in Jesus. Ab abandoning all thoughts of his own self-preservation and self-righteousness, he cried, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Or as some manuscripts say, Remember me when you come with your kingly power. Now this condemned man was perhaps thinking of the end of time when, when the resurrected Jesus would come in godly glory, but Jesus corrected him and said, I tell you the truth, that today you will be with me in paradise. That very day the criminal would be vindicated in God's presence. He didn't have to complete any program. He didn't have to join a church. He didn't have to be baptized. His faith in Jesus changed his future 180 degrees. And forgiveness and salvation through Jesus was his own that very day. Now note when Jesus began his reply to this man, 
He said, I tell you the truth. Or some versions say, truly, I say to you. Jesus was not giving this condemned man wishful thinking. He was giving him the truth that today he would be with Jesus in paradise. Jesus is truth. Jesus, God in human form, the source of all truth and goodness and grace, Jesus gave truth to this man. This truth came from the one who is our way, truth, and life. The truth was that today, the man who confessed Jesus as Savior, well, he would be in paradise with Jesus. He'd be in this heavenly kingdom. Now, that second word, today, has troubled many scholars who say that God's today is not like our time calculation of today, which has truth to it. And besides, they say Jesus was to be in the grave for a time, just a very short time. And yes, Jesus and the other man on the cross, their bodies would be in the grave for a time, but their spirit would be with the Lord. I think of another one of Jesus' words from the cross. At the time of his death, he cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. One of the other Bible translations of verse 43 says it this way, that Jesus replied to the man saying, I assure you, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now imagine hearing those words from Jesus firsthand. I assure you, I tell you the truth, that today you will be with me, no longer suffering in this world, but in paradise. So what's so good about paradise? Well, the word paradise is translated from a Persian word for garden. And in Jewish literature, the word was used to describe that perfect garden of Eden and also the place of eternal bliss for God's people. Simply, paradise referred to the true eternal home for righteous people. One definition of paradise calls it an intermediate place where the souls of the righteous await resurrection of the body and await final judgment. And we have to remember that until Jesus returns, when we die, our spirits go to what we often call heaven. But our bodies do remain in the grave until Jesus returns as righteous judge, and then the resurrection of the body takes place. And when we read in the Bible about heaven, the vast majority of the times, the reference is to the new heaven and the new earth, that eternal home that's established after Jesus returns as judge. That time when our spirits and our resurrected bodies are joined and when sin and death, sickness, all will be unheard of. Truly a paradise, a perfect eternal home with Jesus in God's glory. So what promise and hope Jesus gave that second man on the cross? That man's reaction and response to Jesus was so different than from the other man who was in that same desperate situation. So as we think about the two different responses, what response to Jesus do we have? What is our reaction to Jesus' sacrifice and the difference that it makes in our daily lives? In times when we feel desperate, times of sickness and grieving and brokenness, Do we blame God? Do we turn away? Do we hurl insults at Jesus? Or do we draw closer for comfort, strength, and true hope? I think all of us have known some faithful disciples of Jesus who have had to deal with really tough things in their life. Continuous sicknesses, ongoing losses, tragedies. But these people are a joy. They're a joy to be around because they have known Jesus' truth and forgiveness. They're filled with his spirit and live with the assurance of life eternal that he offers to us all. So let's follow their witness. 
Let's be like that second man on the cross so that when our today comes, the time when our earthly lives are over, we too are assured of being with Jesus in paradise. Continuing with Mark's account from Mark 15, he writes, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And when they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes, and they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. You do not fully understand what it was. A lot of you, I suspect, wear a cross around your neck. Decoration. In my day, it was no decoration at all. My name is Abaddon. I'm a carpenter. Just like the man that you come to remember tonight, he was a carpenter, just like his father before him. That's the way it was with us then. Every Jewish boy had to go to school. And part of our schooling as young boys was to learn a trade. Most of the time, it ended up being whatever our father was. So my father was a carpenter. I'm a carpenter. My father's father was a carpenter. That's how the trade was passed along. I know something about crucifixions, just like every other person living in and around Jerusalem. Crucifixion was the way that the Romans tried to keep us in check. Because when we broke the law, some were crucified. Horrible death. If you were convicted at that time, you were placed between four Roman guards, you standing in the middle of those four, and you were paraded through the town. In front of that was a sign. Whatever your crime was, it was posted on a sign as they marched you through the community. And understand, Wherever you were to be crucified, they didn't take the shortest route. They took the longest. Going through as many streets of the town as they could because they wanted people to see what you were accused of and what was going to happen to you now. You were forced to carry part of the cross, not the whole thing. The cross was a very heavy instrument. The upright beam was already in place at the site of crucifixion. You were forced to carry the cross beam. This man you call Jesus was forced to carry that. From all the suffering he had already been through, he stumbled under it. There was a man, I am told, named Simon of Cyrene, who was forced to help Jesus to carry that cross 
further on to the place where he was to die. He was offered there a, a mixture of herbs and to help alleviate the pain, something this was usually done by the wealthy people, or the wealthy women particularly, of the town as an act of mercy for all those who were to be crucified. So all of us, all of us who lived around Jerusalem, we understood what crucifixion was. But I think I understood it a little more. Maybe in a little different way. I don't know whether you've ever thought about it, but you do know those crosses had to come from somewhere. They did not grow up out of the earth as crosses. We who were carpenters, generally, most of us, were known by one particular thing that we made and made it well. We specialized in something. This man, Jesus, whose death you remember tonight, I am told he specialized in yoke, oxen yoke. In fact, I am told that he even spoke about that at times when he was doing his preaching and teaching. My yoke is easy, he would say. That was his specialty. Mine was the cross. Oh, I wish I had been known for finer things, maybe some nice tables or benches. But the cross was needed. In the Roman time, somebody had to make them, and as my life developed, it fell on me. It was a way to care for my family, so I was always grateful for the income that cross-making gave to me. I have made many crosses over my years as a carpenter. But this one was different. Why? I'm not exactly sure. Maybe it was the teaching that I had heard about this man, the kind of things he did. He, the things I heard about him didn't seem like criminal acts. And yet here he was to be placed upon the cross. Maybe that's why it was a difficult thing for me. Maybe it was the mocking and the beating. Now, nobody who was crucified was treated with care. But not many that I am aware of suffered as much as this man Jesus did, the beating and the mocking that he endured. Maybe, maybe it was the sadness of the women, particularly at the foot of the cross. I could see the pain that they were experiencing and how much they must have loved him. Maybe that's why this one was different for me. But I think probably it was some of the things I heard him say, particularly when he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive that man who made this cross. He didn't know what he was doing. For whatever reason, this crucifixion that I watched was different. I made the cross. That was almost more than I could bear. I made the cross. I hope tonight, as you have gathered to remember what this man Jesus did, I hope you can think about your place. Have you helped? Maybe not in the same way I did with, with hammer and saw, but have you helped make the cross? Have, are you some of the reason that it was necessary? 
I hope you think about that. John recall, recalls the death of Jesus. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received a drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. There. I made a lot of crosses in my life and work as a carpenter, but none of them affected me as this one did. I made the cross for you to think of your part in Jesus dying upon it. I hope that it matters to you. And the cross is more than just a decoration that you sometimes wear, but it is a reminder of how much God cared about you that he gave his son. I made the cross. But think about what part you have played as well. I call upon you now to go, not in peace. I want you to go remembering. I want you to go thinking. I made the cross, and that has troubled me for the rest of my life. Maybe you have part of making the cross as well. But you know that you can still have victory. In a few days, you as God's people will have opportunity to rise again and celebrate his resurrection and the forgiveness that that cross made possible to you. So go, not in peace, but remembering. Amen.